Tyler Keith, how much time do you have? I was introduced to Tyler by his friend, future Wilco bassist John Stewart, at Lafayette, one of those vast piss and vomit spaces that are typical in college towns. Although it was the venue for some of Oxford's most epic early music shows, we saw Warren Zevon there play once to about 10 people. Tyler was young, I'm guessing about 19, and way cute. He was wearing a little striped Picasso tee and the obligatory Chuck Taylor low tops. Even then, he had a bald head. It was too loud for John to give me the scoop on him, but I have to disclose that I thought he was, well, challenged in some way. In this town, possibly because of the precedent set by Faulkner's heroic characters, Benji Compson, Ike Snopes, and Joan Bond, we're not uncomfortable with such folks. You can't always tell. I'm sure Tyler wasn't himself that evening. It wasn't long before I realized that he was actually the most intelligent, wildly talented guy around. Next time I saw him, he was playing with the Neckbones at Ireland's, a late great bar that featured a mural of crosswords and snakes, a giant skull wearing a Confederate cavalry cap, and the legend, Death Before Dishonor. It was there that I got it. The Neckbones, Forrest Hughes on drums, Robbie Alexander on bass, Dave Boyer on lead guitar, were playing some of the best stuff I'd heard from white people since 1979. <laughs> The music was a little Ramones. After all, kick-ass, faux, teenage, ink song should only last about two minutes max. A little Iggy Pop, sex, drugs, and ridiculousness are necessary ingredients, with a little Sputnik Monroe's chimpishness mixed in. But it was music made wholly their own, with goofy, endearing showmanship, accomplished playing, and outrageous original songs that mocked and exposed themselves and life in Oxford. In between songs, the guys embraced old-school punk behavior. They scuffled, told everyone to F off, knocked the mic down a lot, and by making sweaty body contact with one another on a poorly grounded stage, which it, with its far from code wiring, shot the bejesus out of themselves. The crowd was crazy for them. The dancing was so low and dangerous, the, blue, the beer flew everywhere on everyone. It was wonderful. I can only compare it to hearing I can't get no satisfaction for the first time at about 14 and feeling like I had jumper cables clamped to my, um, zooms. <laughs> Not erotic, exactly, but so electrically clarifying. Oh, duh, to hear and dance to this is why we are put on earth. In short, rock and roll. With Tyler singing and wailing on his Les Paul Jr., purportedly pre-owned by Graham Parsons, the band's sound was primal, relying on basic chord patterns, banging, and maximum volume, which could make them seem like just another garage band. But Neckbone songs are so simple, and at the same time so rich with emotional rawness and raunch, with lyrics so funny and so genuinely in the southern vernacular that their music and act feel closer to Jerry Lee Lewis or Skinner than to the Sex Pistols. At some point, someone told Tyler that I had spent a good deal of time in Ann Arbor in 1969 and had seen the Stooges and MC5 play several times in the quad. After that, it was like that infamous Little Rascals episode. Tyler was the wild man from Borneo and I was Stymie with the sack of candy. Whenever Tyler saw me around, he grilled me endlessly about old music and the shows I'd seen back in the day. His knowledge of American music is eclectic and encyclopedic. He knows the music, lyrics, and backstories in rock, country, bluegrass, blues, gospel, and popular songs. I've heard him talk jazz with Hendrix with Barry Han I've heard him talk jazz and Hendrix with Barry Hanna and Tennessee Ernie Ford and the Leuven Brothers with Larry Brown. He knows who Mr. Excitement is and all of Albert E. Brumley's songs. And he plays harmonica, a little piano, and upright bass. As for me, he quickly saw that there were huge gaps in what I knew, especially about music that happened the decade I was on planet Meemaw, pregnant with kids hanging off me. At late night, sometimes Tyler would spin records, yes, those, till daylight, putting on one astonishing album after another that you've never heard or that you'd forgotten. Also a voracious reader, Tyler loved to talk books, and I thank him for turning me on to Jim Thompson, Nick Tosh's biography of Dean Martin, and Please Kill Me. He knows film, and somewhere in his head, he'd tell you, he's mapped out plays and scripts that are, in the telling, anyway, brilliant. 
This brings me to some remarks that must be made about the exterior of Tyler Keith's head. It is the hardest, most indestructible one ever. Someone at NASA or NASCAR needs to analyze it. Ask anybody. We've all seen Tyler's head fall from speakers 10 feet off the ground. We've seen him go head first down the stairs at City Grocery, and we've seen it bounce off walls, dance floors, fists, and other heads. At a party, he once fell 15 feet off a deck into a kudzu gulch filled with box springs, washing machines, and garbage. Some might think his show accidents are pratfalls and find his hammered, drug gimped punk demeanor bogus or pretentious. But there is real and audible impact, and later visible lumps and boo-boos. Whatever, that's not the point. Tyler knows what he's doing. He totally understands performance and the value of theater in a great rock show and in pulling it off without costume or special lighting or any of that crap. I've seen the neck bones use a fog machine, but that's the joke. Mock what you are or wish you were or what people think you are. And there's nothing worth taking too seriously. A basic punk in love. Tyler is a puckish prankster who you suspect has learned a few things from the gods. Mick, Pete Townsend, James Brown, the Rat Pack. He comes by his art honestly too. His dad is a musician and a lay preacher in the part of Florida that gave us the word cracker. At some shows, Tyler falls into fire and brimstone mode, preaching to his flock of sinners about the evils of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and, the, and calling on the book of Revelation. More Marjo or Roger, Robert Mitchell's preacher pal from the night of the hunter than Billy Graham. He nails it. Witness all of this, and you will rage with the other heathens and get what a balls out anything for art performer Tyler is.